Okay, I'm very excited to introduce our next speaker. Uh, and before I introduce her, I just want to say that from one Hispanic woman, uh, and there's so few of us, it's just such a great pride to stand up here and get to introduce another Hispanic woman. So I'm very, very proud of you. Um, and I just want to say that first. So Dr. Andrea Rausa Rivera from CSU East Bay is an extraordinary teacher, collaborator, mentor, and leader. Dr. Rausa Rivera combats systemic and structural inequities through active, inclusive, and engaging instruction. Her values of joy, community, justice, and love can be seen elegantly woven throughout her contributions in three key areas, curriculum and instruction, equity through an innovative assessment, and student research and projects. Her use of language and imagery to bring important concepts to life, allowing students to see mathematics through a new lens, is a hallmark of her teaching. Through the exploration of puzzles versus problems and engagement versus participation, she creates a space for students to see themselves as thinkers about and creators of mathematical ideas. I found it very impressive that in her first three years at Cal State East Bay, Dr. Arrausa Rivera led nine undergraduate research projects with 15 students. The projects relate mathematics and the social, cultural, political systems in the Bay Area. More broadly, she has reinvigorated the colloquium series and brought the 2019 Pacific Math Alliance Conference to her institution. Dr. Arrausa Rivera's generosity, which I love that word, her generosity in creating and sharing her materials has impacted other instructors at her institution and beyond. She thinks deeply about her work and holds the community in her heart as she lifts up her students to be their very best selves. Please help me in welcoming this amazing woman. Okay. Uh, my name is Andrea Arauza Rivera, and I am not a poet. I am, however, a mathematician and thus a writer of truths. Uh, this was the opening line to my personal statement when I applied for graduate school, and I've used it a few times since then on other statements. Um, I remember 21-year-old me sitting down trying to figure out a, a hook for my personal statement. Um, I remember struggling and thinking, man, I, I just can't come up with anything poetic. I don't write poems, I write truths. Nowadays, I can recognize that, in fact, I really was a poet, precisely because I was writing truths. Truths about life, truths about math. Uh, I'm gonna share with you uh, a quote from an essay titled, Poetry is Not a Luxury by Audre Lorde. Uh, the quality of light by which we scrutinize our lives has a direct bearing upon the product which we live and upon the changes which we hope to bring about through those lives. It is within that light that we form those ideas by which we pursue our magic and make it realized. For me, this quote is about reflection, about thinking deeply about our experiences as people and letting that guide what we do and how we do it. Um, so today, uh, I'm gonna share with you two stories of personal experiences that have developed core principles of uh, my practice as an educator. Uh, I was born in Guadalajara, Mexico, to a proud Mexican family. Um, when I was little, we moved from Mexico to Nevada to Mexico to Texas to Mexico before settling in the California Central Valley. Uh, some of those times I was in the U.S. legally, uh, other times not. Um, as the eldest daughter in an immigrant family, I was a translator, a document reader, a form filler outer, uh, in elementary school, on the first day when they send you home with a packet of forms to fill out, I'd guide my parents through them and help them fill them out for myself and for my siblings. Um, I was a leader. I was a, a born and raised chingona. Um, at school, things were a little bit different. Often I was made to feel like 
another immigrant kid that can't speak English. Uh, that was false. I speak English just fine. I speak, spoke English great then as well. I mean, as great as like a kid can speak English. Um, I was also made to feel like, well, she's going to need remediation. Let's put her in remedial math and history. Uh, that was also false. I, I didn't need remediation. Um, they never really talked to me about what it was that I knew. Um, in seventh grade, uh, I was placed in a remedial math class, and I had to act out to be moved out of that class. Um, so in, in the town I grew up in, uh, seventh grade was the transition point between elementary school and junior high. Um, so I, I don't really know how I ended up in remedial math. Uh, they just sort of put me in there. I don't think they talked to my parents or me about it. Um, and when I was in that class, I felt sort of bored. Uh, for one re reason or another, I, I knew a lot of that material already. And I'd asked my teacher week after week uh, to please have me moved because I, I felt like I wasn't really getting anything out of it. Um, and week after week, the school, maybe the teacher, they were spinning their wheels on moving me, and nothing was really happening. Um, so one day, and I don't remember exactly what I did, but I just acted out. And really shortly after that, they, they moved me out of that class. Um, and they put me in pre-algebra, where I, I really should have been all along. Once I got to pre-algebra, I was sort of terrified. Uh, I, I was started to feel like maybe I'd made a, a mistake. Um, you see, in, in my remedial math class, I was bored, but I was comfortable. I, I felt like I was with a group of people that had a lot of similarities with me. The other students in that class were also primarily Mexican immigrants. They also spoke English as a second language. I knew them from community events. I knew my parents knew their parents, so I was very familiar with them. Um, in this new class, things were different. I was different, and I was feeling like maybe I, I really had made a mistake. Um, the teacher for that class essentially told me, try your best, but you probably won't catch up. Uh, that was also false, uh, but also catch up to who? Uh, who was I being measured against? I'm not really sure. Uh, this has led me to uh, thinking carefully about uh, some questions that I, uh, I make sure to consider before I, I plan a class. Um, the story that I've shared, I, I was in seventh grade, and I, I knew I was being treated unfairly. I, and for most of my education after that, I would have to convince teachers and professors that I, I really wasn't behind, that in fact, I wasn't being challenged, that their expectations for me were, were set too low. Uh, school wasn't seeing me for the leader, the critical thinker, the thoughtful and confident kid that I was. Uh, I had to leave those identities at, at the door. Um, so these questions are a few uh, of the questions that I think about when I'm first planning a class. Um, I think about what are the strengths that my students have that maybe I'm not recognizing? Who are they at home and in the community? Um, and how can they bring in those identities, those strengths, and have, them, have those things serve them in, in my classroom? Uh, I think about what assumptions am I making about what my students can and cannot do? And am I limiting my students in some way through those assumptions? I think about what are those assumptions based on? Uh, is it anything concrete, or is it just sort of my speculation? This brings me to my, my first thesis here, uh, which is that I, I really work to recognize the skills and the knowledge that my students come to class with. I work with them, so work with them, to set high expectations for them uh, and how they're going to grow their skills and expand their knowledge. Now, um, I, I can't talk about setting high expectations without talking a little bit about assessment. Um, this is a picture of me. I, I think I was like a fourth year in graduate school at this point. Um, this is a picture with my advisor and some of uh, his, um, his students, so my mathematical brothers. I tried to find a picture of myself from like my first or second year, but I couldn't find any pictures that wouldn't be horribly embarrassing to show you, so this is going to have to do. Uh, I started graduate school in 2012, right after undergrad. Um, so let me tell you about the first exam I ever took in, in grad school. Um, it was a, a point set topology class. 
Uh, the professor was a tall guy, broad shoulders, um, sort of stern, but generally friendly demeanor. Um, the exam was a four choose three exam. So one of those exams where you, you're given four questions, you choose three to answer and be, be graded on. I got a 66% on that exam, um, which for me, I was used to getting A++ pluses on my exams in undergrad. So that was a, a big shock for me. It was very different. Um, that is until I realized that many of my classmates had scored closer to 30%. And that experience taught me uh, two things. Um, two things that are sort of hilarious to learn at the same time. Okay, so this is the first thing that I learned from that experience. Um, I'm somehow great at taking exams. And so, yay me. But also, uh, exams are trash. My classmates and I, we'd spent day and night devoting ourselves to open sets and continuous functions for weeks before that exam. We'd studied together, we'd problem solved together, we presented in front of each other, we figured things out with each other, worked through examples. I knew that my classmates knew more than 30% of that material. I knew that that exam wasn't giving an accurate picture of what they knew or what they could figure out. So I really internalized this idea that exams really weren't saying very much. Uh, later on, I would learn uh, what exams sort of do seem to say. Um, they somewhat seem to measure stereotype threat. Um, maybe your ability to manage anxiety, whether or not you have the money to pay for the SAT prep class. Um, not mathematical knowledge, not mathematical creativity, not really anything that I think makes for a good mathematician. Uh, I have a feeling, uh, and once again, maybe nobody in this room, but some people, might hear me say, set high expectations, and think that what I mean is make your exams harder. Um, that is not what I mean. Exams are trash. Uh, and I think we're more creative than that. Uh, and I know we're better problem solvers than that. Uh, so as we work with our students to understand what skills they have um, whether they're excellent presenters, whether they're community organizers and activists in their community, whether they're poets, how, how can they bring those skills that they've developed and have those skills be present in the mathematics classroom? So I think along with that, I think about uh, how can we create assessments uh, that tell us about our students' mathematical growth while also growing meaningful skills that are going to serve them later on. Um, now, I, I don't mean you have to change everything in your class all at once. Um, you can start with just a, a few things. Uh, so here are just a, a few examples of what you could do. Um, you could replace an exam with a, a two-stage exam. Um, two-stage exams are essentially you do an individual portion of the exam, and then you follow it up with a group portion of the exam. Um, if you Google two-stage exam, there are a lot of resources for it. Um, you could replace an exam with concept maps. Um, so concept maps are a way of visualizing how all of the material in your class is interconnected. Um, looking at concept maps that your students have made can give you a really great idea of how they see everything fitting together. Um, in a calculus class before, I've done a mix of standards-based grading and projects. Um, so I've done maybe standards-based grading to uh, assess some more computational learning goals um, and then projects to think about the more in-depth uh, concepts. Maybe now some primary source projects would be a good idea in there. I'm going to look those up. Um, invent something, right? We're creative problem solvers. Uh, we can invent something. Uh, how can we understand how much our students are learning, what they're learning, what skills they're developing in our classroom? Uh, think something up, try it out, collect some data, and publish it. Uh, we need to know more about assessment in the math classroom. Uh, I'm going to end with uh, gratitude. Uh, I'd like to acknowledge the Tokobaga people 
and all native people who were stewards of this land uh, until the violent European colonization in the 1500s. Uh, I want to thank Suzanne Weeks, Cynthia Wiles, Selena Bañuelos, Cynthia Flores, John Rock, Robin Wilson, and so, so many others who have believed in me and set incredible examples for me. I want to thank Julie Glass, my former department chair and current associate dean, for nominating me for this award. Let's see if I can make it through these. Uh, for nominating me for this award. Um, Julie, thank you for leading the first math department that ever made me feel loved. Oh man, I haven't even gotten to my parents yet. Ugh. To my wonderful colleagues at Cal State East Bay uh, and throughout the CSU system, uh, thank you for supporting me as I learn to become a better teacher. Uh, I really think that we can change the world. To my partner, I love you. Uh, to my parents, Eliseo and Olga Rausa, and my siblings, Fernando and Michelle. I'm very proud of you. Thank you for teaching me about hard work and about not letting people take advantage of me. To my students, thank you for all of the trust you have in me. To my audience, uh, I wish you joy. I wish you peace. I wish you clarity. Together, I think we can move forward. Adelante. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for and, uh, your talk. It was very inspiring. And uh, my question is, uh, uh, could you say something more about assessments, you know, and what has worked in your courses, like uh, presentations or something? Because we don't have sometimes time to do all these uh, projects and things like that in classes. But uh, can you tell us more about it? Thank sure. you. Yeah, I, I think um, that it's, it's definitely, so these different assessment models, um, it's definitely an exercise in thinking about taking something and replacing it with something else um, and not adding on to the things that you're already doing. Um, so it, it's really a reimagining of what your math class is going to look like and what assessment is going to look like. Um, and it requires a certain amount of uh, letting go of the, the, maybe the norm, the tradition that many of us have been educated under, um, and really trying to reimagine a, an entirely new mathematics classroom and a, an entirely new assessment. Um, so I, I don't try to sort of fit in these new ways of doing assessment with old, older practices, more traditional practices of teaching or of assessment. Um, I, I really try to just reimagine what a class could, could be. Um, and I think with that freedom, it, it gives me a chance to not worry so much about, well, what am I not going to cover? How am I, not, how am I going to fit in this other exam or this other final? Um, it's really a, a reimagining. Mm -hmm. Yes, so uh, my classes range from anywhere from being capped at 30 to 40 students. So they're not huge lecture classes. Um, for presentations, I often have them do like um, they're in groups, so they present to their group. And so I can have maybe five different presentations going simultaneously. Um, so it takes a little bit of creativity and how to make sure that the classroom doesn't become like just completely overwhelmed with sound. Um, so sometimes, you know, we take over the hallway or the outside staircase or something like that. But I, I try to think about, okay, how can I get more than one thing going at the same time? Exactly. 
yes, there's only one of me, and I, I think that I give good feedback, but there are many, many of my students, and I think that they can give good feedback as well, because they, they know what it's like to sit and listen to a presentation where they understood absolutely nothing. And they also know what it's like to listen to a presentation that they really actually got something out of. So I, I think that they are as equipped as I am to give each other feedback, and that allows me to have more than one thing going at the same time. Yes. Oh, great. So I can show off Cal State East Bay. Cal State East Bay is one of the most diverse uh, universities in the country. Um, if you look at the pie chart of sort of demogra racial demographics, it looks like one of the truest sort of sliced up, evenly sliced up pie charts that, um, that you could possibly find. Um, we have a, a very diverse mix. I won't try to like recreate what the exact numbers are for you, but it's, it's very diverse. Um, 